started when you started doing what we called the summits. We talked about the summits where you yeah. bring everyone together, and it's great. I like you know, we try to continue the tradition of writers working with the game designers as yeah. close as possible. And you pioneered that I think in a lot of ways. How did those in your time? Because you were it was like you said the Wild West. You know the universe is kind of wide open. Did you come in with a plan? Like okay, well, I want to focus on this, like the concept, or, thing, or it was kind of like, hey, we're going to throw this open to the table. Best idea wins, for example. Really, a combination. I mean, sometimes we had we had kind of long term plans that we were moving towards. I mean, the biggest of those was uh, the the for the Babylon simulators. Right. So we'll we'll talk about those in just a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you know those uh, because again. I had started FASA just to get rid of night to be able to build that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, seven years later, uh, uh, FASA actually was doing well enough that we could start that. And right. it's, we started uh, it was originally called uh, Environmental Simulations Project because it predated the virtual reality name and then later, later became Virtual World Entertainment. Um, and uh, and it, was a, it was a great example of being able to take a successful company and drive it into the fucking ground. <laughs> 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 something you should have never been doing. <laughs> um, uh, so sometimes that maybe they can bite you in the ass. That's, that's yeah. not what was in there. Yeah, so because FASA was doing great, and then you know, we started this thing, which I think when we started it, we thought it was going to cost three or four hundred thousand dollars, which back in you know 1980s was a lot of money. It actually cost like three million dollars back in the 1980s. Was it? Um, and, and, you know, and so we really, it really became a problem um, in terms of like it, it put a real crunch on FASA. Um, but yeah, so that that's um, I don't know how we got off on that, but that. But that oh, I was saying, oh yeah, so so the, the the challenges we had from a technological standpoint in creating the the pods were very numerous. But one of them was uh, how to get a variety of mechs on screen. Yeah. Okay. Because there was no such. I mean, this predates. You know, we couldn't do polygonal because it was just going to look like crap. <clears throat> so we had this idea of doing sprite-based stuff. So we had to pre-render all the mechs and their poses. And if we did that as full mechs, we would only have like you know three or four mechs in the game, um, and that just felt enormously limiting. So we said, oh, let's break the mechs down into component parts. Torsos, arms, legs, <coughs> and upper torso, lower torso, arms, and legs. And then when we put those together, we can now get you know, 64 mechs out of the combinations of those. Um, so that's, that got driven to that. We started working on the, the look and feel of that, <coughs> that build. And then I was like, OK, now how do I write this into, <laughs> into Battletech? Because Battletech is you know, as far away as you can get from component mechs, right? And none of the tech or culture of the existing factions uh, was going to support that. Um, and so I started thinking about, well, also, you know, how do we bring a new kind of fresh perspective, you know, mix it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and so I looked back through all of our old stuff and I was like, well, we did leave this little hanging, you know, open-ended thing with Kerensky. Let's mm -hmm. go back and touch on that. Mm -hmm. And so that's what came up with, all right, well, they went out there and they were, you know, Start for resources and they started to build the whole kind of component based systems. So that became a long arc that at the yeah. you know at, at the summits we were planning for. Well I remember it, you and I were at, at the Gamma Trade Show. You were reading uh, Warrior Repose because in manuscript. And we were walking the floor and we were talking about you were you were you were talking about how this new technology would bring it in and, and we talked about Kerensky and their being out there and I remember you saying, Well originally you know, we never, there was never going to be anything. Right. And, and, you know, we're just, and, and I said, and look, you know, it, Wolf's Dragoons has got to be tied up with them, right? And you're going, well, no, originally we hadn't had that. And we're walking along and I go, oh my God, they're not Wolf's Dragoons, they're the Wolf Dragoons. Yeah. And it was like, you know, the two, we looked at each other like going, Oh, That's okay. Fair. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. yeah, and that was, you know, okay. When you go back to Phoenix, write this up. And so there was, we 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 had the the first of these summits, which led to the twenty year jump. Um, you know, I had done the original the 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 basic probable probable evolution of the clans document. We had that, and I remember <coughs> we're sitting at Ross's place doing this, and we're talking about is it going to be a ten year jump or is it going to be a twenty year jump? And uh, I was looking at physical spreadsheets uh, that I had done and, and uh, 
someone, whether it's Ross or you, looked at me and said, well, Mike, what do you think? 10 year or, or 20? What's going to be easier to write fiction? And I said, well, 10 year jump, we have Dan Allard and like two other characters that we can write about. Because uh, all the older guys will be too old, all the kids will be kids. Yeah. You know, but 20 year jump, man, we got everybody. <laughs> so I was like, okay, 20 years, that's what we're doing. And that was... That was how that was decided, and then it was. And I remember again at that at that particular uh, summit meeting. Uh, you know, one afternoon you drove us out to where the we all got driven out to where the pods were being developed. Get to sit in the pods, you know, see stuff and everything like that. It was like, okay, got it. You know, this is. Now I know why you're bankrupting fast. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody thought it was a cocaine problem, but. <laughs> Um, yeah, there was no such thing as a network card. We had to build one. We had to design that from scratch. We had to design our own. We, we, we used a, a chip that was designed for uh, doing rotating titles on, on football games. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and then built the entire uh, graphics system off that. I think somebody earlier mentioned, remembered that Amiga was in, in there. And it was. Um, the, first, the very first generation of, of uh, cockpits had an Amiga computer. And then um, uh, it had the 16 megabyte memory card. That <laughs> Huge literally, at the time. Literally this big for 16 megabytes. Now you can't even buy a chip anywhere near that small. Um, and then it had our own graphics card. So the actual Amiga display was only used for doing the radar scope at the bottom. Okay. The, the main view was, uh, was done uh, through our own graphics card and then our network cards. And then we had to create all these I.O. cards for all the displays and all the stuff around here and so on. Um, so yeah, it was actually quite uh, quite advanced from a technology standpoint. And uh, we started getting a lot of visitors from the US government because they were working on a project called SimNet, um, which was tank simulations. And our cockpits at the time cost around $15,000 to build, and their tanks were costing around 300000 to build each tank. Oh, this is a DOD. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was also because you know, we were using microcomputers, right? And we were right. cheating. Right? And this was a, the whole thing was a giant cheat, right? Cause it was, um, um, but that's what you can do in entertainment. Um, but yeah, it, that's let me on a career of working, you know, it's really weird and interesting meetings with the DOD and, and, and committees that went on for a while. Um, but yeah, it was quite, it was quite advanced uh, at the time. Uh, and then uh, what I should have done is just left that technology alone and built more software for it. But of course, I felt like, oh shit, you know, they're gonna get people catch up with us, and this cheat isn't gonna last that long. Mm. So, you know, then continued to develop new hardware sets. Um, so we our second generation that came out two or three years later was was fully polluted. Um, and uh, and what, at that point was one of the more powerful political systems in the world, and then we just kept reinvesting it, which was stupid. But <laughs> <laughs> by the time I'm sure you, I mean, you believed in what you were doing, it's the oh, yeah. of hindsight, obviously. <laughs> well, I, I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, yeah. I think the hindsight it, uh, was that we we could have rested on one technology rather than keep reinventing it quite so quickly because it was quite so, it was very expensive to do so. Um, but yeah, so we built the first one in Chicago, uh, opened up in the end of 80, end of 89, and then we uh, did uh, a couple in Japan in 91, and, and, uh, and in California, uh, and then in 92, the Disney family, led by Tim Disney, bought a majority of the share, a majority of the company from us. And that was virtual world, right? Yeah, that's what we kind of translate, transition to virtual world entertainment. Um, and then we built 35 of those centers around the world, um, and started to really kind of be esports thirty right. years before esports, exactly. with you know local, regional, national, and international tournaments. Um, and I, you know, as much as the learnings were on the hardware and software engineering, the real learnings were were about the social dynamics of multiplayer games, um, and th that's that was the most interesting part of, of the whole thing. How so? Um, well, I mean, we, you know, we had before that there was no multiplayer games we could right. around. So Other than zero table, for example. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> the ones we love, which are in the tabletop. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, so it's like trying to figure out how to create a larger social <coughs> um, social kind of connection around it. So the the experience was that it was uh, you'd go in and you um, you would go to the pre-show or briefing room, 
and there you would get, uh, you could choose which mechs you were going to use, uh, you choose, as a group, you would choose what scenario you're playing, what terrain, what time of day, and, and so on, um, eventually weather, things like that. Um, and, uh, and you had a little time to, you know, work with your teammates, develop a strategy. You met your opponents, which I think was also really important. Then you'd go into launch bay and everybody would get in their own cockpits. Um, and you had 10 minutes to accomplish your mission, whatever, whatever that was for the scenario, within that period of time. And then after that, you went to the debriefing room. Um, and uh, in the debriefing room, uh, you, this technology developed a lot over the course of time. When it, when it first came out, you saw little dots moving around because we captured all, we captured everything at the network event. So you saw a little like, top-down view of everybody, and then you know, quickly after we got into Lindo, it was now a full video. It was like a movie where we had you know cameras and everything, virtual cameras, and captured everything, and you got that whole experience to relive it. And then you got your your um, printout, which had kind of like. This is this is your story of what you did while you were there. So I'm going to question: Which do you think? Which of those three phases do you think had the most impact um, on the business overall in terms of people playing more? The debrief. The debrief. Absolutely right. It's the same question. I was lecturing at, at USC um, uh, earlier this week and had a, a, a group uh, of professionals from China that were there, and they didn't get that. <laughs> because they they were not they didn't understand they don't understand the, the social dynamics like you tabletop does right? right that concept of being able to <clears throat> talk about it relive it together right yep. is so important because it, 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 that's where friendships were made that's where that's where the kind of that was you that came behind the ridge and got me and like yeah. let's go do it again yep. <clears throat> um, and so yeah that was that was incredibly important before I forget and you can go find this online there is a training video, I guess, with Jim, is it a Jim Belushi? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would love to know, I'm sure, how did that come about? <laughs> so, uh, Jim came into to, uh, uh, to the center, and he was playing, and he, he would come back, and he came back a handful of times, and when he was there once, I said, so, what would you think about shooting a video with us or <laughs> trading for this? And he was like, totally game. He was like, yeah, no problem. He didn't charge us a penny. We couldn't wow. afford it a penny anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he just—he was just totally game for it. It is, it is a true time capsule. It's go. If you haven't seen it, go find it. It's—it's oh, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it was a pleasure. Wow. Work. It was no problem. Um, and actually, uh, uh, there was a, uh, Kurt Russell was in town for backdraft, <coughs> building backdraft in mm -hmm. Chicago, and he got really hooked. And so he was coming in all the time, uh, and then he started dragging all of his co-stars and everybody in. Wow! Um, <coughs> they would start to they rented out a number of times. And so then after that, it was like he it was like when everybody, whoever from Molly was here, they would have to come stop. He started been telling them about it, you know. So that was kind of fun. <laughs> At least gave him a lifetime membership, right, or something. No, actually, my dad. <laughs> my dad was really spoiled. My dad became our partner in 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 FASA because. As fast as started to really grow, I realized I couldn't manage the business side and the creative side, so I was need to find a business manager. <coughs> and so I asked my dad to help me find a business manager. And like Mike, I'm a huge fan of history. I read a lot of history. If you read a lot of history of business, you realize that most of the time the business manager just steals the money and fucks you over and leaves. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, if I hire my dad, mom would yell at him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, safety net. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so he became uh, uh, Ross and I's partner in FASA uh, for many years, and he always had lots of precious advice. And one of the things was, is that you know, if you give stuff away for free, then that's how they value it. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, that made sense. So yeah, no, we never made those rich Hollywood people pay for it. <laughs> So we're at the bottom of our first hour. Why don't we take like a five minute break? And if you guys don't mind, we'll reconvene and have ask some questions. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, everyone get stretch legs. Take five minutes, we'll come back and we'll keep going for the second half.